Chairman, uh, the Labour Party will of course be supporting uh, this bill. I think it has some worthwhile measures in it. Uh, there are a range of questions that I'd like to ask about it, and I'm curious that the Minister in charge of the bill is not the Minister who introduced the bill, but I think we all understand the reason for that. Uh, with the controversy swirling around her, she would not be in a fit state of mind, actually, to manage this bill through the House. And I'd have to say, to be honest, Mr Chairman, I'm not going to dwell on this, but frankly, uh, there is certainly amongst many of the parties in this House a total loss of confidence yeah. in the ability of yeah. the Minister. Uh, the failure to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is surely fundamental to the justice point system. Of, so point, it's point, of order, point of order, uh, Tim McIndoe. <coughs> this member, who is an experienced member, is now straying far from the bill uh, and look, making allegations I'm that are unfounded. I'm, I'm the judge of that, and I know the member's coming back to the point. So that the Honourable Phil Goff. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. i just finish on that point, that it really is important of all people in the House, most particularly for the Minister of Justice to see, be seen as a person that can judge conflicts of interest, that is a person of full integrity and tells the full truth. If I come to the bill, sir, um, the bill is incremental in the changes that it makes, and I'm not saying that hugely as a criticism. Um, we've built, we have, over time, uh, really strongly improved the provision for victims' rights. It's fair to say that uh, when I started studying law, there were only two things that were important in the courtroom. One was the prosecutor, who was prosecuting on behalf of society, and the other was the accused, who was uh, uh, trying to defend their innocence. And the victim really wasn't part of that. And it was shameful that our justice system paid so little attention to the needs of victims. Well, the, uh, the fourth Labor government began the process, I think, with the Victims of Offenders Act in 1987, if I recall rightly. And as Minister of Justice in um, 2002, I was responsible for passing the Victims' Rights Act. And I've got to say, I picked up that bill from the National Party in opposition. But I'm um, not sure whether you were here at the time, Mr Chairman, but if you were, you'll recall that the uh, victims' rights bill that was on the table when I became minister was a very weak affair. It uh, was talked vaguely about the rights of victims, uh, but it actually didn't do anything uh, to cast the vague principles as explicit rights. And what we tried to do in 2002 was to set out the explicit rights that victims had and the mandatory obligations on specific government agencies to uh, make sure that those rights were upheld. Uh, victims had to be informed about the progress uh, uh, in the case against the offender and serious offences. I brought in the provision that uh, they needed to be uh, able to have an input into decisions on bail. I think that was really important. The victim on bail decisions should be able to express their fears and concerns and that be taken into account. We strengthened the victim impact statements. We promoted restorative justice processes. Uh, and. The interesting thing about this part one of the bill is that it builds on the things that we put in that Victims' Rights uh, uh, Act of 2002. And I think from time to time we do need to come back and look at whether the Act is working as well as it should do. And one thing that happened under Labor in 2007, if my colleagues will remind me, we set up the uh, Select Committee inquiry, the Justice Select Committee inquiry uh, into, into victims. And building on that material and subsequent material, we have these changes that I think are worthwhile in their own right. They're not revolutionary, but they are worthwhile. I want to pick up uh, a couple of points, probably four major points in relation to the bill as it's been reported back. And the first thing that I want to pick up is, you know, is the question of funding adequacy. And what I'd refer you to, Mr Chairman, is page five of the regulatory impact statement which said that the agencies have indicated that to successfully implement the proposals, they'll have to reprioritise funding from other areas. If funding can't be reprioritised to provide these additional resources, then this may result in pressure on services and service delivery may be affected. Well, that is vitally important, Mr Chairman. Um, you know, one thing we know is it's one thing to have rights and, and, and people responsible for upholding those rights, but if you don't fund it properly, 
uh, then how can we be confident that this will work? So a specific question to Mr Woodhouse and the Chair tonight is what was done in response to that concern raised in the, imp uh, the regulatory impact support uh, uh, statement, I should say? Have the resources been provided? Are they reprioritized, Mr Chairman? Are they reprioritised resources from other areas, in which case which areas have suffered cutbacks? Or have, has the money not actually been determined yet? And do we face the potential prospect of setting out some very good rights and processes, but with an adequate funding to make sure that those uh, things are carried into effect? And particularly if I look at the question of restorative justice, uh, because uh, I put restorative justice in the original Act. I'm glad to see that, that is, there's still an emphasis on that. But in the bill, it says about subject to resources. Well, yeah, I know everything's subject to resources, but will there be adequate resources to ensure that restorative justice processes can be held and that they can be held properly? Because again, if the resources aren't there and it's not done well, restorative justice, instead of having the positive impact that it might, actually can have a negative impact. If, if the homework isn't done, the support services aren't there, uh, then it can turn out to be negative for the victim when it could otherwise be a very positive experience. Mr Speaker, uh, there are other things that seem to have missed out in relation uh, to um, this bill and this part uh, because of lack of resources. I know that in the, uh, in the regulatory impact statement they talked about setting up a victim centre uh, that would uh, give oversight to victims' rights and they talked about a victims of crime complaints officer. Now, both of those seem to have disappeared. They're not in the bill. I can't find them anywhere. They were recommendations, uh, but they haven't been picked up. We still do have the code, and I think the code is a good idea, you know, to, to ensure that uh, victims have information about their rights, the services available to them, the duties and responsibilities. That goes a little bit further, but not necessarily a whole lot further than the original Act. But the code itself is a good idea, but why did the Minister Woodhouse might like to answer this one too? Why, did, why were those other ideas dropped? Why don't we have somebody there uh, that will give oversight? Why don't we have a victim centre as originally was looked at by the, uh, by the Ministry of Justice? Mr Speaker, the question of the victim impact statements I think is central. I remember um, watching a program where uh, uh, Gil Elliott was talking. He was the father, of course, of Sophie Elliott that was murdered, and he was expressing intense frustration that he was allowed to give a Im victim's impact statement, but then somebody was censoring everything that he wanted to say in it. Now, I accept there will be a need to be certain restraints on victim impact statements. You know, it can't be offensive in terms of the language used, uh, and it can't direct the judge what to do, but within reason, the victim has to be allowed to vent their feelings, or the family of the victim in, in, in the murder case, they have to be allowed to vent their feelings as part of their uh, uh, process of being able to, to put that crime behind them. And there must be nothing more frustrating than a victim being told what he or she can or cannot say to the judge in the court and to the offender that's sitting across from them in the court. So I hope that this bill is interpreted when it becomes an act in a way that actually emphasises the rights of the victim. And it might be uncomfortable for the offender to hear what the family of the victim is saying, but so it should be uncomfortable for the offender uh, if that offender has been convicted and is guilty of sometimes a terrible offence and in the case of this family, uh, the taking away of their beautiful uh, daughter and the arrogance, the extreme arrogance that the offender expressed in the court during that process that all of us saw in the televised accounts of it. So I think the bill is basically right, uh, that the, the victim, the prosecutor or a person nominated by the victim can read out the statement. And I like the wording of the language that the judicial officer must agree to the request made unless he considers or she considers it inappropriate to do so, um, you know, and there are reasons set out, quite narrow and specific reasons. But I think the emphasis here must be on this process serving the, uh, the, the victim or the family of the victim. The person has been convicted at that stage, 
they are the, the judge is considering the sentence, the judge needs to know exactly what the damage that has been done to that family is uh, and what might be regarded by them as a way of, if it's possible, to put things right or go, certainly go in that direction. Uh, there's pretty free reign given to the judge under uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, I call Carol Beaumont. The Chair, um, I rise to speak on um, part one of the...